Okay, I uh, want to introduce you to uh, uh, Jim Benson, and uh, the world is full of visionaries, of course, there are, there are lots of visionaries, and there are visionaries, and there are doers. And uh, Mr. Benson is a doer, and uh, he's been the founder of Space Development Corporation. He's working with the nation's leading space scientists and engineers to develop the enterprise to properly utilize abundant, valuable mineral and other off-Earth resources. And uh, I'd like to come up and tell us about it. Thank you. Hi. Um, all your questions about uh, near-Earth asteroids are about to be answered. Um, but be before I get into that, I want to give you a little bit of background so that you'll understand in part uh, who I am and why I'm doing this, which I think uh, may be important uh, for all of us to Identify. I was born in 1945, and at the age of uh, 10 in 1955, I, uh, after many years of tinkering with toys and erector sets and Lincoln logs, uh, I stumbled on the book I, Robot by uh, Isaac Asimov, and uh, I think that changed my life. I also joined the Science Fiction Book of the Month Club in 1955 which delivered every month a hardback uh, science fiction book for one dollar. Um, a year or two later, I saw the rings of Saturn through a telescope, and um, uh, I'd never seen anything like that. The pictures in the uh, books just um, had nothing to compare with uh, the reality of seeing the, the rings with my own eyes. I followed the early space program, probably like anyone did, and uh, as a matter of fact, I drove down here to watch the very last liftoff to the moon. And uh, at that point, I lost interest in the space program. There was really nothing to hold my attention any longer. I was never able to get excited about the space shuttle, and even to today, uh, watching government employees play with slinkies in, uh, in space is just, just not exciting to me. I got involved in computers in high school, and I've been involved with computers my entire life. Um, they just got in my blood, and I've, uh, I've enjoyed being a pioneer in many fields of the uh, computer industry. Just out of necessity, because I was writing books as an environmentalist at the time, in 1977, I got my first microcomputer, and it ran under CPM, and it had an 8-bit processor, and I paid a small fortune for 16K of memory. <laughs> Um, I was an early adopter, not because I was any kind of a, a genius or a futurist or um, uh, a think tank sort of person who should have seen what was coming. I simply used them because they were there and they were available to me and they got the job done at a price uh, that I could afford. Who possibly could have seen or who did see what was to change our lives when public got access to the computing capabilities. It's totally changed our lives, it's changed our society, it's changed the economic system, it's created a massive number of jobs, new industries, millionaires at age 20 uh, all over the country, and it's just causing the entire world economy to boom. But back then in 1977, 1978, 1980, IBM dominated with big iron. And they dominate the industry through the FUD factor, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. If you didn't go with IBM, you were a flake or you were a bad business person. And if anything didn't go wrong, it was your fault because you didn't go with the big guys. And they dominated the world. Unbeknown to IBM, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were working in their garages uh, to make the computers for the rest of us. Uh, who could have seen Bill Gates? being asked by IBM, do you have an operating system, and having them lie to them and say, yes, I do, and sign a contract only to go out and buy one uh, in order to be able to deliver. Who could have foreseen somebody worth $42 billion of personal net worth and a company the last quarter reported $9.5 billion cash in the bank? Nobody saw that coming. Well, I believe that in 1997, we're where we were 20 years ago with computers. We need access, public access to space. We need to get the cost down, and we've got the equivalent of the Steve Jobs and the Steve Wozniaks working in the garages, and their names are Gary Hudson and Bob Zubrin 
and uh, Mike Kelly and Kistler and George Henry, uh, George Spencer. I forgot his name. The big dumb booster guy. So in any case, uh, this is, the work is being done, and I'm telling you, for whatever it's worth, in my opinion, we're going to see a revolution in the economic and social systems globally when the public has the same access to space that they do have to computers today. So at 50, uh, a couple of years ago, I was very lucky to be able to sell my software companies and, uh, and retire at age 50, only to become uh, very bored at uh, 50 and a half. Um, I tried to get back into the computer field since I've lived it for 30 years, and uh, I just didn't find anything that challenged me. Um, I felt like I had sort of done it all. So I looked around for something that would provide a personal challenge for me, and also something that would help me make money, because I do enjoy both the challenges of making money. I approached this uh, with a completely open mind. What is it that personally interests me that I can go out on, this, on a challenge and try to make some money, and I don't care what it is. So I re-examined my life and, and the things that uh, interest me, and what I discovered was I've liked science and technology all my life, and I've been an amateur astronomer since I saw the rings of Saturn. So I thought, well, okay, science, technology, astronomy, space, make money, space commercialization, and there I have it. So I got on the internet and I started uh, searching the web and joining news groups and uh, just quietly lurking on all the different news groups, finding out who was who and who, in my opinion, uh, was on the ball and who wasn't. And I started corresponding with people via email and I went back and reread The High Frontier and a book by Brian O'Leary. <coughs> and I pulled out of a stack of papers that I had filed away years ago. In 1991, I remember seeing a little newspaper article in the Washington Post by, it was announcing a discovery by senior research scientist Steve Ostro of JPL. He had found that by reflecting massive X-rays, uh, radar, off of near-Earth asteroid 1986DA, he discovered that it was a solid ball of metal, about a mile in diameter. I have something very similar to that. It's a piece of stainless steel that the Earth ran into. This used to be an asteroid. This contains 10 to 100 times the concentration of gold and platinum <coughs> that is being mined anywhere on Earth today. That 1986 DA near-Earth asteroid has a street value of over $80 trillion. It has enough steel in it to provide all of the steel for the entire world for 400 years of today's rate of consumption. Well, I, that caught my eye. I, I found that little newspaper clipping all yellowed in the pile of papers that I put it uh, six or seven years before, and I got on the email, I contacted Steve Ostro. We corresponded back and forth, and he strongly recommended that I buy a couple of books by John Lewis at Arizona University. Mining the Sky, which is a popular book, and I highly recommend it, write it down, Mining the Sky, and a second book called Resources of uh, Near-Earth Space, which is about a thousand pages and more technical. I attended the Space Frontier Foundation meeting in Hollywood last uh, October, I think it was, and then followed that up with an NSS ISE meeting in San Diego, and I ran into Dr. Jim Arnold, founder of the UCSD campus, the first founding director of California Space Institute. And um, I quickly fell in with them, working on what I was conceiving of as a new project. They put me in touch with Gene Shoemaker, and my board of advisors has grown to be a who's who in science and technology. What I decided after reading all of these books and considering all the different possibilities from low Earth orbit to the moon to Mars, and near-Earth asteroids, it became clear that low-Earth orbit is only good right now for communication satellites or tourism, and tourism is too expensive and it requires too much. The moon is actually harder to get to from a delta V point of view than near-Earth asteroids. You have to fight the gravity of the moon down and back out again. Getting to a near-Earth asteroid requires just a very small extra boost uh, as you leave Earth orbit, and you're on your way and you glide for anywhere from three months to 15 months, and you're there. 
and you rendezvous with, it, with another very small delta V change. Mars is too far away. I love it. It's romantic. And I sure wish uh, we could go there, and we will pretty soon. But it's just not technically feasible right now, or economically feasible. So I thought, okay, if you're going to do something in space, like any anywhere else, if it doesn't play, if it doesn't pay, you can't play. You've got to be able to make money on these things, or it's just daydreaming. So here I was, thinking about forget low Earth orbit, forget the moon. Forget Mars, near Earth objects are easy to get to and they have concentrated wealth on them. Big deal. What can you do with that? You have to be able to make money from that. So I started looking at what does it cost? Because if I know what it costs, then I can kind of figure out how much it's going to take to um, uh, make up that cost and make a profit. So I looked at near, near Earth asteroid rendezvous mission that had a uh, public cost of $150 million, and you basically double that to $300 million. Near is on its way. It's going to pass by one asteroid this summer and then uh, rendezvous with another one in a year or so. $300 million of our money, five instruments, that's $60 million per data set. So basically, we as taxpayers are spending $300 million to get back six sets of data. And that's what NASA is in the business of doing. It's spending our money to get information. And I agree with a gentleman before that says uh, information is really great because it doesn't weigh anything. And if it's valuable, uh, you can make a lot of money from it. So I called the people who put together NEAR uh, at Johns Hopkins University, and I said, you spent 150, they were saying 120 million. And I said, out of that 120 million, I want you to build me an exact duplicate of NEAR. How much would it cost? No R&D, no reinvention of the wheel, just make me another one. And they gave me a, a, an incredible answer. I knew that out of 120 million, minus 50 for the launch, at least 70. They quoted me 90. And you know that, that put an upper limit on things. So I started looking around. I started working with the University of California, uh, San Diego, and uh, Dr. Arnold, and two other universities, uh, teams of students. I've gotten the cost down from 90 million to 80 million to 50 to 40 and below. We're now below 40 million dollars for the near Earth asteroid prospector, the first private spacecraft to ever leave Earth orbit, the first private spacecraft to ever visit another planetary body, the first private spacecraft to land on another planetary body. We're planning a launch in the year 2000 or 2001. And basically what we're doing with this mission is we're going to try to prove that space is a place, it's not a NASA program, that the public can get to space without depending on NASA. NASA plays a, a very tiny role in this, and it's very important for me to make this project 100% privately financed. That's important because when we arrive at the asteroid, I have three goals, size it, Classify it, touch it. That's basically the design spec, three words. When we know the size and the classification, we can calculate the content and we can estimate a street value based on the mineral content. And this is a little bit of a showmanship thing because it'll be worth over a trillion dollars and it would be nice to say that we've flown out to an asset worth a trillion dollars. We're then going to touch it which means we're going to land on it. And I will treat that as our corporate representative staking a claim on another planetary body. And in fact, not only will we file mining claims and mining patents, we'll simply say we own it. It's very important that we have private property rights established in space because investors are hesitant to put money in projects until they know that you can really have this stuff out there. So there's a precedent that's already been set, a geosynchronous belt is extremely valuable and the slots in there are presently worth hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars. So people have already staked a claim on property in space. It's just not tangible property. And we intend to do that and start the process rolling to establish private property rights in space. Are we going to mine it? Not the first go around. The first flight merely, merely needs to get out there and collect scientific data. For example, if we have three instruments on board and we fly for $30 million, we'll be collecting data at $10 million per data set, not the $60 million that we're paying as taxpayers 
through NASA. One sixth the cost. If we can sell that data at uh, a third the cost that NASA is paying for it, I'll double my money. So we're looking at the, feasible, the possibility of selling data at an extremely low rate below the market and being able to pay for an entire enterprise um, through this neat project. So we don't plan on mining it the first time out. We basically want to prove that the public can go to space, the public can go to deep space. We can make money on private ventures in space and try to open up uh, space to the rest of us. The asteroids out there are kind of interesting. Uh, in my mind, there are three different types. There are the metallics, which I have here in my pocket, 4.6 billion years old, as old as the solar system. You have the carbonaceous chondrites, okay. which aren't, I mean, can you imagine on the metallics of arriving at a mountain of solid stainless steel that's a mile in diameter, and your little spacecraft comes up beside this literally mountain of stainless steel, how in the world are you gonna attack that thing? How are you gonna you know, get anything out of it? Um, I don't think you are. So as fascinating as an $80 trillion asteroid is, um, it's gonna have to come later. Next down on the scale are the carbonaceous chondrites. It's a rock that's fairly easy to drill and crush, and chondrites implies that it has little metallic chondrules in it so that when you crush up the rock, you could drag a magnet through it and pull the metal right out of it. In addition, 5 to 20 percent are clay-like materials, and through heating, you can extract the water. As mining geologist and engineer David Cook likes to say, in space, Without water, nothing is possible. In space, with water, everything is possible. Water is the key. 20 to 50% of all near-Earth asteroids, the scientists believe, are made of captured, expired comet cores. That means they're dirty balls of ice. That means they're water. And water makes anything possible. Can you think of anything easier to mine in space than a big, dirty ice cube? It's not that hard to crush. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to. Focus a mirror on it and melt it. Take the water back to low Earth orbit, put up some solar panels, which we've been doing for over 30 years. Put your two electrodes into the water and oxygen and hydrogen. Rocket fuel, standard oil of space. If the Industrial Revolution is going to move to space, we need energy. There's a lot of solar energy, and it's good for a lot of things, but we also need rocket fuel. If we want to quickly get to the moon, if we want to quickly get to other asteroids or to Mars, what better way of getting there than to lift up from Earth, fill up your gas tank, and take off to Mars? When you get back, refill, and go again, because you've got the gas, you've got the fuel, uh, it's available. Another thing to keep in mind is that anything up there is already worth $10,000 a pound. That's what it costs to get it up there. If it's already there, it's already worth $10,000 a pound. So basically, when you look at the economics, you can burn up a lot of processing and energy and mass requirements, subtracting away from that $10,000 a pound until you get down to an attractive price that people will pay to use it. So there are an awful lot of possibilities for using these highly concentrated, easy to get to uh, asteroids in space. Now, in order to fly out to our asteroid and touch it, we looked at a lot of design uh, possibilities, and it's really complicated to land on a little orbiting, a little rotating body that has no gravity. If you touch it, you're just gonna get sort of thrown off again. So we're gonna fly one or more canisters to the bottom of our spacecraft, and we're gonna put an instrument in one of them, and we're just gonna drop it down to the surface of the asteroid. This is interesting. If you are 10 kilometers up, which is the sphere of influence of gravity from a small asteroid, and you drop something 10 kilometers down to the surface, it will hit with the same force as dropping something from here to the ground. The gravity is so weak. It's easy to get something down to the surface, surface so we'll inject a little canister with a scientific instrument, an alpha proton X-ray spectrometer, so we can do a very detailed analysis of analysis of the elements on the surface. So the first mission is not to mine anything. You don't have to capture uh, near-Earth asteroids. You don't have to bring them back. First off, you simply have to prove that you can do it and at least break even while doing it. 
and I believe that that's possible, and I'm committing myself to uh, making that happen. We've identified 14 sources of income, any three of which, well, three of which can pay for the entire mission. So there are a lot of economic possibilities to exist right now today and are becoming more feasible each year that goes by. It's going to take us about a year to raise the money and finish the plan and design. It will take two years to build the spacecraft, and then it will take six months to 15 months to fly it to the asteroid and make our, uh, collect our scientific data, sell it, touch the asteroid, make our claim, have a public offering, raise an awful lot of money, and then we're into phase two. Phase two is the long-term exploration, private exploration of space. And uh, that's the door that I'm trying to open because I've been waiting for this all my life and it's not happening. And I think I'm in a position to help make it happen. So through this project, I hope not only to, um, I have definitely found my personal challenge, there's no doubt about that, so I was successful in that already. Um, whether I can make money or not, I don't know, but I believe I can, and everybody has a role to play in this. I need your help, whether it's just to, from your personal encouragement, express an interest, help network information about this, uh, make contributions, invest in it. There are lots of roles provide scientific or engineering experience. We've got a team of almost 50 people now working on this project, and all of it so far is on a volunteer basis. I start raising funds in about three months, and I'll be able to talk less freely about it then because of securities uh, regulations. So I'm kind of giving you a heads up right now. If you're interested in keeping track of this, please take out your pencil and paper and uh, write down my email address. I have a little mailing call, a mailing list called Friends of Deep. And if you just send me your email address, I'll put you on that distribution list of uh, once every few weeks to get a little status report. The email is jim at, that's the little app, spacedev.com, S-P-A-C-E-D-E-V.com. And um, through this project, I hope to uh, create the race to space, a new gold rush to space, it's the infinite frontier. We've waited long enough for it. I want to show that the public can be involved. We don't have to wait for NASA. Uh, if we can make this happen, then it's going to be space for the rest of us. And I don't know who among us could foresee the positive changes that will come out of giving the public access to space any more than they could have seen all the positive benefits that came out of giving public access to computers. So in the last 16 years, look at the changes that we've gone through from IBM's introduction of that lousy little PC to today and compare that to what can happen over the next two or three years when the cost of getting to space drops in a similar manner and we can all be involved in it. No one can perceive the changes to society and I submit that they will all be good and they'll all be positive and uh, let's get on with it. Thank you.